Hey, welcome back. Today we have an interesting little project. We need to make three of these parts. This is for a university project. I will talk about that later, but let's start with the part itself. As you can see we have technical drawing. Top view, side view in a section, section BB. That's through here, looking against this cut surface here. It gives us this cross hatched surface, which is this part here. And we have bottom view. Also, we have a a section view through, yeah, uh, yeah, cu uh, cut CC, that's this one here, cutting all the way through here and looking against from this direction. Gives us this arched top surface with a radius of 16.5. Uh, the part needs to be machined from stainless steel, 1.43 05 or a similar steel, uh, 14305 is a free machining quality of stainless. I don't have this one at hand, but I have a 1.4301 here, which this is the ISO material number. In the ANSI world, that's a 304 stainless. And the uh, 4305 is a 303 stainless. Since I have a very good fittings piece of stock, 14301, 6 millimeter thick, final part is 5.5 .5 thick, so I have some allowance on here. I will use that. It's a little bit less nice to machine than the 14305 or 03 but it will do fine. When we look at this part, at the overall shape, we see in the top-down view that we have this C shape here in this large, long slot here. And my experience tells me that we will get problems with warping if we cut the slot and finish it. The part will warp, definitely. So what we're going to do is we're going to slice some material off, oversize, final part is 15 millimeter. We'll cut it to 17 millimeters. That gives us one millimeter of allowance on each side. Then we will rough out the slot, which will be four millimeter on the narrow end, and rough this out to three millimeter. We will just run a three millimeter end mill down the middle and take out all the tension of the stock, and then we will go from there. Otherwise, um, I think we will end up with, with something that looks like a very much bent oak C shape, which we don't want. We have fairly loose tolerances here. We're going by ISO 2768 medium. That's an M, <laughs> M for medium. And you take your trusty uh, Tabellenbuch Metall and you look up, up here, um, ISO 2768-1. Tolerance class M for middle or medium. A dimension plus uh, a dimension 0.5 to 3 can be plus minus 0.1. 3 to 6 millimeter can be plus minus 0.1. 6 to 30 can already be plus minus 0.2. 30 to 120 can be plus minus 0.3. So this is a system for standard tolerancing on, on parts that you don't want to tolerance, but you want to give the machine shop an idea how, how critical a dimension is. And if you put uh, something like ISO 2768-M on a drawing, he knows to stay within those tolerances. Anything that's more important will be toleranced separately. When we look at the drawing again, um, 4, 30, all these are nominal dimensions. That's where, where this counts. If we have a dimension like 38 minus 0.2, like this one up here, uh, this, is, this is different. So we have 38 minus 0.2. This can be anything between 37.8 up to 38.0000, whatever. We don't write tailing zeros, of course. So good practice would be to machine it to center of tolerance. So um, 
center of tolerance would be 37.9. This, this would be the target dimension that we would shoot for and that gives us 0.1 millimeter of tolerance to both sides. Makes it very easy. Same for the width here, uh, 15 minus 0.2. And looking at this makes me already know, and I also have the assembly drawing, uh, that this needs to fit in a cutout because they dimension the outside, they tolerance the outside dimensions minus. Here we have a slot, nominal width is 4 millimeters plus 0.1. That tells me that there probably needs something to fit between those two sides of the slot. Something will be sliding in. So they go on the safe side, they put a plus tolerance on it and the matching part probably has a minus tolerance. But overall, nothing crazy. Everything is well within 0.1 millimeter tolerance overall. This would be a function related dimensioning. If you put, if you take this dimension and you write there, instead of 38 point uh, 38 minus 0.2, you write there uh, 37.9 plus minus 0.1. Both of these mean the same, but this is easier for the machine shop and this is easier for understanding the, the assembly in conjunction with the other tolerances. So. It depends on what you want to do. I started to slice down the length of the material to get my 40 millimeter width uh, before milling it to size. And I can already see uh, that there's something wonky. <laughs> uh, this is my regular saw curve down here. That's the width of the saw blade plus the uh, set of the teeth. And it's a little bit, it's about uh, three times that down here. So, uh, this material has definitely um, some tension in it and we're releasing that when we cut through it like this. So, uh, next will be cut here. This blade is a little bit... There is somewhere at least a bunch of teeth missing by the way it behaves. Means very rough. I laid out four pieces, two lines and saw between the lines. Before I cut those four individual parts, one spare, uh, I'm going to mill it a little bit oversized um, to width. Just run an end mill over both sides to clean it up. We're over at the mill parallel in the vise. This is the Coltron side. Coltron finish goes on parallel. Uh, 3000 RPM, four flute carbide end mill. You saw me do a climb climb cut pass down there and a climb cut pass up there. That means I get virtually no burr on the outside. Instead of moving one time over it with a slightly larger end mill and have a heavy burr on one side, I prefer to do a to do two cuts. I always have to love when I see uh, people use a face mill in a single pass and then file a ridiculous burr on one side of the part. <laughs> That's uh, very ineffective to me. And the little burr it creates can be wiped off with a finger, so there is no real burr present. Uh, just breaking the edge a little bit. And now we will do something that will save us some time. Drop the part flat in here and square off both ends. Just, just do a light cut on both ends. Do one cut, uh, flip the part and do another. And the reason will be obvious in a second.
one side, quick deeper. And when you file for deeper, I like to file towards the surface we just milled, like this, and then take the file and run it flat over the surface to remove the secondary burrs from filing. Yes, secondary burrs exist and are a real thing. There we go. Uh, now we will slice off one part and take the larger piece, go back to the mill vise and recut it. Just do the same cut again that we just did and do the same on the other side. And that way we will end up with four parts that are already milled on three sides, uh, square and straight. So makes it easy. I call this technique the self-squaring salami. parts, three sides, three sides milled and squared and we have a piece large enough to be held again in the vise like this and mill, side milled. Okay, here we are back at the mill with the piece that's sawn on both sides dropping back in the vise. The vise jaw will do a perfectly fine job of squaring it up and I have a one of the cutoff pieces, three sides square, out here uh, to balance up the vice jaw, otherwise it would crook by a lot. Or uh, it would clamp the part, but it's not good for the vice. So that's good practice here. I'm going a little bit much into detail this time with screwing up the stock and how, I, how I'm processing the stock. Because I noticed that, for example, my, the apprentices that we get at my day job, when they come from the apprentice shop, this is stuff you don't learn in the apprentice shop usually. This comes from a little bit of experience and or you have seen a, somebody doing it. That was the case in my, uh, well, that was my case. I saw this and it made totally sense. So that's why I'm showing it too. Also notice that I did do, uh, when I take like cuts like this, uh, I take primarily climb cuts because the finish is nice and it's easier on the machine and easier on the cutting tool. On, on heavier cuts you better are careful what you're doing. That's the second side. Now we can split this piece through the center and also have two pieces like these two that are square on three sides. We can cut all four pieces now to the same width by dropping them on, on parallels. I have parallels here, horizontal, that are slightly narrower than the four pieces stacked together. These four pieces are 24 millimeters in total stacked up and these parallels are 22 millimeters. So I don't pinch the parallels in the vise and I raise them up with two additional parallels down here. We tighten this down a little bit and because we cannot trust them to be down on these parallels all four by themselves, we will take a copper drift and seat them properly onto the parallel shouldn't be moving by now and give the vice a little bit more grunt. Uh, there is no high precision required at this point and for measuring the width we don't. <laughs> uh, we're taking the quill with the end mill. We drop the end mill down onto a parallel. Careful not to damage the end mill. Like this. Zero out the DRO. This is now our zero and we move up by the desired width of the part. Four parts. Just need a quick deburr on the belt sander or a file. Then we cut the slot in the center. 
I have my dial test indicator here in the spindle. We need to find the center of the stock to rough out the slot. I'm going to make contact with the fixed jaw first, like this. Uh, sweep for the high spot. And crank it to zero on the dial of the DTI. Zero out my DRO. Spin this thing 180 degree without bumping the indicator. Make contact, sweep for the high spot. Crank to zero, half of the DRO measurement, crank to zero. And now we can double check by moving the indicator in position like this. Find our zero. Find the high spot. Uh, zero out the dial here. Zero. And zero. So we're exactly on center here. That's perfectly fine. And you just saw, uh, it's very quick using the dial test indicator for this kind of operations. Let's drop down on the work to get our zero. When you do this, be super careful not to crack the end mill. Carbide end mills tend to lose their front cutting edge if you do this careless. So I want to rough out the slot to three millimeters of width and uh, 31, 31 millimeters length. So I'm going to drop down and just touch the work with the end mill. Okay, I just scratch the work with the end mill and, and zero out the DRO in this position. Now I can just drop down and take my uh, repetitive cuts to final depth or <laughs> in this case, until we are all the way through. Okay, this end mill is not behaving very well, but we will go with it. Uh, we'll increase the RPM to 3000 and use cutting oil. This could help in this case. I took 0.5 mm depth increments and used the cutting oil. Uh, this is Yokish Alpha 93 heavy duty cutting oil. Let's see. Let's see if the part. Yeah, the part seemed to have moved a little bit. I zeroed out the calipers back here where it didn't move. And now we're checking the front here, and it's not crazy. It's only 0.1 mm that the part opened up. That's. I expect a little bit more. We might have gotten away without roughing it out this the way I'm doing it now but better be safe than sorry so yeah the slot is also kind of on center it's it can't be precisely on center because I took a fairly heavy cut for such a small end mill and this and the end mill just bends away on the cutting force but here we go not not too much of of deflection here so let's rough out the other three ones. I'm cutting the parts to final width. Now, as I have seen that the, the warpage is minimal. Okay, there we go. Checking my dimension here. Nominal 15 
and we're minus 40 micron. So overall tolerance would be 15 minus 0.2 millimeters, but uh, I have to, it's, it's the rather bad habit, but I like to stay close to nominal minus a little bit in this case. So the part is still close to normal. I know that's a bad habit, but that's just me. At least I know it's a bad habit. And also notice that when I put it in here in the vise on the parallel and clamp down on it, I didn't hammer it down onto the parallel because that would bend the part most likely in this area. And we don't want that. I'm skim cutting the back side just to clean it up a little bit. Then I'm going to cut the front to final length. This has to happen very careful because this is like a tuning fork now. Light skim pass with six millimeter end mill gives nice finish. We skim cut the first side. Now we can flip the parts around and hold them like this and climb cut them to size. There we go, 50 micron on the size. Very nice. It's the next day and somehow overnight the spindle of my mill changed from MERSIP 4 to ISO 30. So now I'm running these super nice uh, small ISO tool holders, number 30 taper, in this mill. I will talk in a separate video a little bit more about the spindle exchange and why I did it. Uh, the change itself is very easy. You can buy the whole quill assembly with a number 30 spindle from Kami Machine Tools here in Germany. Costs about 350 euros and is pretty much ready to go. And this allows me now to use these super nice side lock holders, which has just a set screw to hold the end mill in place. Some people don't like them very much. I love them. They have an excellent run out, tool change, uh, especially on a manual mill where you're changing tools all the time because you're doing some crazy stuff and you don't have an automatic tool changer. It's very easy because you just use a T-handle Allen wrench here, loosen the set screw, pull out the end mill, put another one in and you're ready to go again without having to change the whole tool holder. It's very quick and the run out on these is just uh, spot on. <laughs> it's like three microns on the shank of the end mill down up here. So that's good enough for what I do. But here we are continuing on these parts and now I'm finishing the slot to size. It's a stepped slot. So first we will cut it full depth to four millimeter and then we will put in a step with five millimeter width. I balanced out the wise jaw with gauge blocks back here. Don't use your good gauge blocks for this. Use some scrap ones. I was... <laughs> Yes, I have scrap gauge blocks. I buy very cheap gauge block sets that look awful on eBay, de-rust them with Scotch-Brite and use them as uh, blocking material on mill and lathe or grinder. So here we are with our three millimeter high-speed steel end mill in this case. I roughed out the remaining material in one millimeter depth increments and now I will finish it at full depth to uh, width. So I'm stepping over 0.3 millimeters for a first pass and I, I do this all climb milling. Because when you do conventional milling, the end mill tends to get pulled into the work. With climb milling, it tends to get 
pushed away from the work. We will probably need a spring pass here. Check with a 4mm gauge block. Yeah, 4mm gauge block is still no go. So let's take a spring pass here. High speed steel cutters tend to get deflected more because uh, high speed steel is three times less stiff than carbide. So a spring pass will always be necessary. There we go. That's a 4 millimeter gauge block. Looking good to me. Now we cut the step at full depth to size. Roughing in two side, side steps and then finishing. Let's check with a 5mm gauge block. Should be on the very tight side. Yes, indeed. So we're opening up to, two, 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 20 microns per side. Okay, here we go. Yes, that's a nice... That's a nice 5mm gauge block fit. <laughs> this is 505 and this doesn't fit anymore, so we're nice on the, on the tight side. Very close to nominal, but very free fit. Exactly what I want. So, part comes out. And here a quick look at the sidewall finish and the step we machined in there. Also, 5mm gauge block fits in all the way to the bottom of the slot. Uh, when you cut some, a feature like this, always make sure that your end mill is not worn tapered and the mating part can, can go down all the way. Very common mistake with slots and pockets. Have them taper to the bottom and the mating part only goes in with a hammer. Now we're doing this milling operation on the back which just leaves those two strips and takes down all the other material around it. For that make sure the part is clean, we drop it in the vise up against our stop here, make sure it's nice and seated, lock it down and we get the tool out of the spindle because we need to change tools. One nice thing about the i30, that's also the main reason why I switched, it need extremely little uh, height above the table to change tools. Only like 10, 20 millimeters of clearance to get the tool up because the taper tapers down more than a Morse taper 4. If you compare it to a Morse taper 4, which has about the same gauge diameter here, not only is the Morse taper 4 about twice as long, it doesn't taper down as much. That means that you can't tilt it to the side to get it out of the spindle to clear it. This one doesn't need as much height and can tilt it out the side way easier. Let's, let's take our height. This is a 6mm carbide shank. I drop down the tool I, until I cannot get my end mill under it. Then I retract the spindle slowly using the fine, fine feet of the quill. There we go. Put in the diameter of our carbide shank and we're good to go. Now we picked up the height without damaging the tool. Drop it down 1.4 millimeters. Final depth will be 1.5, but I'm roughing out everything at 1.4 in case something weird happens. And I'm just stepping in from the side.
and I would change tools because we need to open the slot in this position here too to have the same height level as the step we just machined around the part. This is a three millimeter two flute Mitsubishi carbide end mill. Since all the milling is done, I'm drilling the holes now. And for that, I'm holding them in the vise like this, clamping parallel. And I use a gauge block stack that's close fit in the slot here to prevent the slot from getting crushed. And I'm also clamping in the center of the vise so we don't put unbalanced load on it. As you can see, the counter bores go very, very close to the edge of the part. For that reason, I'm, I'm centering each part, or at least double checking each part with dial test indicator in the spindle of the mill, so I make sure I don't break through the side of the part with the counter bore, because that looks stupid as hell. <laughs> drilling 2.2 millimeter, drilling the counter bore with a 4.3 millimeter drill, and then following with a flat bottom 4.3 millimeter drill to remove the drill cone. Uh, these still look but ugly because this top surface has still 0.5 millimeter of allowance that will get cut into a radius in a large I think six and a half millimeter radius something like that. This is a 3d printed dummy of the mating part it doesn't really fit but um, it goes in this position on the real part and create somewhat of a guide in here where a part is sliding back and forth. Also before we cut the radius we need to trim these edges down here to 45 degree and also chamfer the outside edges one by 45. So part goes in the vise. I have some very narrow spring steel parallels. These are out of pre-hardened spring steel uh, or spring hard spring steel which comes rather straight and I just abrasive cut strips out of it and ground them parallel to act as parallels. They are very useful when you need to drill close to the edge of a part. Part goes in against the stop. Don't crank down on the, on the vise like, like a madman. We start but with a 3mm carbide drill that I'm just using to spot drill. Carbide drill is very rigid, doesn't, doesn't tend to wander off and also they are usually grind in a way that they cut very freely. Usually they have a four facet grind and they drill on point. <laughs> Just putting a very, very minute mark on there using the carbide drill. 2.2 uh, millimeter high speed steel drill with a four facet grind. Drill all the holes. Now we change to a 4.3 millimeter drill to do the counter bores. These go to a certain depth, so I move a little bit over, touch the top of the part with the drill, and zero out my DRO. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, last tool. Same drill diameter, but shortened with a small abrasive cutoff wheel, and then ground flat with about 5 degree clearance on the D-bit grinder. I'm going to use this to clear out the drill cone. The other drill is 118 degrees tip angle. And we need to get rid of this because there is a regular screw going in there with a cylindrical head. Touching off on, on C height. Uh, adding some cutting oil. We don't need a huge amount here. There we go. When drilling stainless, especially a grade like 304 stainless that tends to work hard and under pressure when the drill only rubs, you need to keep a steady feed. Just keep the, the cutting edge in contact with the material, in the material cutting, and not let, have it rub. Have it rub and you will kill the cutting edge. And also don't go crazy fast. That's why I did run this at 300 RPM. Four beautiful countersinked holes, counter board, and we did not, not blow out the ends here, or here, or the sides. Which is a, a good sign. That's my setup to cut the chamfers on the edge of the part. And this is a little bit uh, weird setup because you will see in a second why. I have a magnet plate here in the vise, small uh, 125 millimeter magnet or 150 by 150 millimeter magnet. Toolmaker's vise on top, set with a 45 degree block to my desired chamfer angle. And now you're saying, uh, why don't you just put the part like this in a vise and cut the chamfer with a regular chamfer end mill. You're right, that, that would be perfectly fine. I also needed to chamfer these corners here and you cannot do that, those with a chamfer end mill. You need to come in with an end mill from the top and cut it at 45 like this or the other direction. And that's why I have it set up like this and I'm reusing this setup to cut the, the outside chamfers too because it works so nicely. I have a stop here on the side of the vise, which is just a strap clamp. Part butts up against it, sits on two parallels. Parallels are, are held in place with a, uh, with a spring between the par uh, parallels, so they don't fall out. Part goes up here, uh, gets clamped. And now my position of this, this vertical edge is defined. Now I can just side mill with the 3 mm carbide end mill my chamfer. And I do not have to, to pick up this uh, position each time. Go. First one. I don't want to take super crazy heavy cuts on this chamfer because we are only holding the vise on a magnet. But for these light cuts, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Now we can flip the part around to the other side. And the last one is on this side. There we go, all four sides chamfered. Uh, gauge block stack can go out. The very last step is to cut this large radius here. 
This is a R16.5 millimeter radius that gives a diameter of 30, 33 millimeters. I made this ring with bore of 33.02 millimeters, aimed for 33, but uh, too stupid to read the two point internal micrometer. And I'm using this against the light source to check my radius. But how do you cut this radius? I could 3D profile it on the CNC router without a problem, but the CNC router is currently set up for a completely different project and I don't want to tear it down or mess with it. We could do it on a lathe with an arbor and uh, have it rotate at the diameter we need and just turn it, but this part is rather fragile with, with those two prongs sticking out here. We could do it on the surface grinder, cylindrical grind it, with a spin fixer or on a tone cutter grinder, also just rotate it under a grinding wheel, or we can mill it. And the last option is what I choose, mill it on the manual. I used the indexing head as a fourth axis and I turned the part like this under an end mill. And this is the surface finish I got with a little bit of scotch bright. There's a little bit of a line. I need to do a little bit of blending on it, but it, it's really, it's really okay. That's my setup. I have my Walter UTA80 dividing head in one of my vices, and I made an aluminum arbor. It's held in the three charge chuck, and it's milled to accept the parts, just like this. The slot is in, when it's vertical, is in Y direction on center, and has the correct depth to the center of rotation to give me the radius I need at the height of the part I need it. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit tricky, but I, I, I sketched it out and it worked right away. Well, on the second try. <laughs> this, uh, this other feature down here is first try, which I fortunately enough realized soon enough. So the part gets screwed in with four M2 screws, tiny screws. screws go in like this. Yeah, these screws are partially milled away because they stick out. The real screws that will be used with this part are slotted head screws where the head is only 1.3 millimeter high. And the idea now is we just move with the end mill X back and forth and we rotate the indexing had a little bit more each pass. How much? I'm not sure, I'm just eyeballing the, the crank handle. Okay, this took about four minutes to cut. The result is really nice. I, I'm not, I can't complain about this. I'm, I'm really happy how this looks. Take it off the fixture. See if we can get these screws out. I'm going to take new screws for the next one because the heads of these are already pretty mangled up and I'm worried that I might not get them out if I take another pass on them. They cost like two cents a piece, so that's okay. 
here's the finished part. Ooh, that's, that's really a decent surface finish. So shiny. <laughs> uh, keep in mind this is 304 stainless. So uh, usually if you get a decent surface finish on it, it looks okay. These are the parts after some uh, deburring and finishing. And the finish is quite decent. I'm pretty happy how these came out. That's the back side. And my trick for a good finish that I found out is uh, a scotch bright wheel. Not the giant one that you know that you put on a bench grinder, but a tiny one like this one. I think you can buy them, but these are easy enough to make yourself and pretty much no work at all. You take a regular uh, arbor for a rotary tool that you would also use for a cutoff wheel, like this one. You take the arbor and you take some uh, scotch bright. Take scissors. By the way, I used these scissors only to cut abrasives because cutting abrasives is fairly hard on scissors, as you might expect. Then you cut two squares. Uh, clip off the corners. Get rid of the abrasive dust on your table. Um, place them on top of each other, kind of kind of center to each other. Uh, take a punch. Uh, kind of centered a hole and you come in with your screw other side of the arbor and if you don't have to explain it on camera or show it on camera you get a nice uh, scotch bright finishing wheel that's almost running true. It's self-truing in use. Uh, after a few minutes in use, they look like this. They don't last very long, but on small parts, they work excellent. They give a really nice edge on corner round over and clean up surfaces very nicely, a very satin-like finish. So, and don't run them at crazy speeds. I, I run them at 10,000 RPM max. Otherwise they, otherwise they start to sound a little bit dangerous. This is at 10,000 RPM. That's very reasonable. And the idea is you take your part out to machining, you take a good carbide burr and you run it across all the edges, create a little chamfer and then you come back with this and blend everything just over. And that gives this one piece look. Uh, let's do one. When doing deburring or edge breaking with a carbide burr and a die grinder, don't get greedy. Take light passes, always climb cutting if possible. And after each pass, evaluate what's happening. Also, when you go into corners, take the corners slowly and orient the part so you can, for example, take an internal radius in, in one sweeping motion. Same applies for long continuous edges like, like these outside ones. Light passes, evaluate what's happening after each pass and don't get greedy. Even convex edges like these work very well. Changing to the scotch bright wheel and with this you cannot do much wrong. Just, just hit all surfaces and edges and also constantly evaluate what's happening, looking at the result and correcting your, uh, the application of the wheel if, no, if necessary. <laughs> This is, this is, to me, the most fun part of making a part. Getting rid of 
of the majority of the machining marks, getting, getting the edges and corners right and just make it look nice. Here are the finished parts, two of them. I need to ship three, I made four because one is in case I mess something up. Packaged up and ready to go. So I hope you enjoyed this rather thorough walkthrough to these parts. Thank you all for watching and I'll be back.